and okay so basically the goals today we're going to like Zareen said we're going to talk some strategy and we're going to really dissect um the contract the one to four contract is what this is based on um, and then we'll also talk about some of the addenda to the contract and talk about timing um so some timing issues and go through some of the um other pieces that aren't addenda but um, are important to the transaction like the title commitment so do any of you guys have like specific things that once you're in a deal you had a challenge with or that you want us for sure to cover i mean we cover a lot in this class but if there's anything specific you want to talk about you can share it with us now and jump in it's very you know, we like interact activity so yeah and just um, you, you know what does a lot for me is listening to examples of what you're seeing angela that's going wrong mm -hmm. best intentions gone awry because um that that seems to be sort of where sorry to turn my camera off that, that's where I, I i learn a lot from from you no i agree and once you make the mistake and it costs you money or hurts your client then you won't do it again so yeah so we can share some of those things with you so absolutely all right Go to the next slide. Are you looking at the components of the deal slide? Uh huh. Okay. So okay. Okay. Things. Sorry, I, I can only see part of it. Um, no, no worries. Okay. So we're going to start with title commitment and objections, and we're going to talk about the survey, home warranty, H mandatory HOAs, um, lenders, and appraisal are some of the things we are going to touch on today. So title commitment. Okay, so what is a title commitment? A title commitment is the title company's promise to pay title insurance policies after closing. So it is basically a pre, it is basically a pre title policy and kind of lets you know what is and isn't cover and it will include the same terms that the policy is going to have. And the title company is who orders it, and they have 20 days from the receipt of the contract to produce a title commitment. Um, the rates for title, the policies, they are set by the state, by the Department of Insurance, and there are calculators in that online. You can say my con my contract is $653,000, and it'll give you exactly how much it's going to be. So that is a good amount that is a good thing to be able to share with your client um in terms of who pays for it um it, it is a checkbox okay on who's buying the the buyer's policy and historically um it has been the seller a seller expense which would always be probably the seller's biggest expense for closing costs next to commissions but in this um competitive market we are seeing probably the majority of the contracts these days with the buyer um, offering to pay for it. So um, again, it's a negotiated term. And uh, a lot of times you'll hear agents that like mistakenly say like whoever's paying for the title policy gets to choose the title company. And that's kind of like realtor urban myth. That's not true. Who the title company is is just a negotiable term and who's paying for it is a negotiable term although angela's right like historically in the industry the seller paid for it but in this market when it's such a seller's market now the buyers are does okay. that make sense a lot of times realtors will push back and be like well, we're paying for it so we get to choose and that's not really true and it's you're just, not necessarily married to the title company that is put in netris in, in mls uh, the preferred title company you know, I mean, if you're trying to make your deal more favorable as a buyer to the seller, choose that title company, maybe. But right. um, and, you know, some I know some agents who are like so in love with their title closer. They just I, I don't know. I'm of a little I. I don't know. I just think there's other things to get all worked up over for your client other than having a big fight about the title company. And I know I can think of two agents who I, I know who, who are like that. They will like only close with this one title company, for instance. Right, yes. Okay, so the parts of the, of the title policy. Um, Schedule A is the details of the transaction, the buyer's name, the sales price. So always look through it, make sure it's correct. Um, 
Um, the type of interest um, in Texas, most of our transactions are fee simple, which means it's a full and complete ownership um, and that the seller has the ability to fully dispose. Um, section three is the legal owner, um, the current owner, the seller. So make sure that matches the contract. Some instances where it wouldn't match the contract might be um, if this if this buyer, when they presented the contract, you know, had gone straight off of the county tax records and it just said one person's name um, and that person had gotten married since they bought the house. Um, so we got it. We, we got to adjust for that and make sure that is all correct. So in estates um, are another thing. If someone has just recently passed away. Um, you know, we need to make sure that has been reflected in it. So um, if, if you know there, it's, there may be an issue, um, look really hard on, on that to make sure it is correct in the lines. Yeah, so, so Schedule A is the first page and that's just the information page. And that's kind of, you wanna just double check. There's, a, there, there's the primary policy that will protect the buyer, right? And the title company is saying, we are promising that when you receive title from the seller, that it's good title and no one else has rights to this property, right? And then the lender always gets like a piggyback policy. So typically the buyer pays for the lender's policy and it's just a fraction of the cost because it's piggybacking onto the primary policy. But there, you, that's why you can see there's a policy amount for the buyers and a policy amount for the lender. Does that make sense? Oops, I went backwards. Okay, so that's schedule A. Okay, Schedule B, that's really directed at the buyer and the lender who will receive the policy, and it includes the exceptions to the policy, things that the title policy is not going to cover. Um, and there are some standard exceptions that's like, you know, language um, from the Texas Department of Insurance, and those really aren't changeable. And then there are specific exceptions that may relate to this specific piece of property. Um, and so, you know, make sure this is where you want to make sure to review for use and encumbrance to make sure you can building lines and setbacks. This is important. So if you're planning to do construction on the property, anything else you want to add to that, Serene? No, it's a good idea just to look and see what's listed there. But generally, you're going to see these generic exceptions like parties in possession, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes it'll show mineral leases. It does not always. Um, so it might have a general exception. And then, yeah, like the building setbacks, it just shows you the things that the title company are saying. Like if you close on this property and you have an issue with the building line, there's no coverage because we warned you in advance and we accepted, we made an exception to coverage for these things. So one through nine are all boilerplate. 10 is where there are specific exceptions to your property. So that's what you need to look at. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Any questions there? Guys, this is the very quick and dirty on title policies, we can have a whole class on this um, to really get into it, but just to give you guys a general idea of the A's, B's, and C's. You know, I've never run into a title problem, but what kind of, you know, what kind of gotchas are happening right now? Anything that's noteworthy? Otherwise, look, normally any deal I've personally been on, they just kind of go through. That's exactly what I was going to say. All the, you know, the few houses that I've been involved in, I've never even read it. I mean, so should we really suggest our clients, and I'm talking about my own home, not one that I've sold to anyone, you know, to say to really read through it. My, my guess, my, my personal, hey, this is Wayne here, my personal feedback would be the biggest challenge would be an estate situation where um, the person who actually home, owned the home had passed away and an estate or family was addressing it. I mean, basically, that's what I've just seen over the years um, happen and to me, that would be the biggest gotcha you might run into. And I could be incorrect there. No, no, that's exactly right. And there's two separate issues. So Wayne's talking about really kind of a Schedule A issue where, you know, you go under contract with the person that you think is the seller when, in fact, their, their brother and sister also need to sign off on it, right? Because the will wasn't probated properly or anything like that. So as a, as a seller... As a listing agent, if you get into a situation where the person inherited the property or they bought it when they were single and then they got married, it's never a bad idea to get in touch with your preferred title company before you even list it and say, can you just clarify for me like who really needs to 
sell here because it's one thing for us to sign a listing agreement with the wrong party and it's just between us and them. It's a totally other thing for us to have someone bind themselves in a contract and then not have all the right seller parties on the actual contract to sell. So that's a, it's a good, really good point that Wayne makes. You want to make sure you have the right parties, you know, listed right here in um, section three with the vesting, the vesting deed or, you know, how it passed through a estate. So that's, the, that's kind of the ownership issue with respect to schedule B, like issues relating to the property. I mean, a lot of times what you'll see is they'll be like, oh yeah, we redid the driveway and um, it's a little, it's a foot over onto the neighbor's property, or, you know, we moved the fence and the, or the, our, the neighbor's fence is on our property. And then the buyer gets mad because they're like, I've lost the six inches of property. So sometimes you see stuff like that. Um, and then you, the parties just have to work it out. So as an agent, what you need to do really is just advise your clients to take a look and just be able to explain to them, like, you're going to get an insurance policy that says like you own this property and no one else has any rights to it on the title commitment. It's going to show you in this schedule B item 10, like what are the exceptions, the things that they're not insuring. And then they can take a look at it. And if they have questions, you should just say, let me get you on the phone with the title company and they can walk you through it. And it's not our job to be title experts or to explain how this works to our clients in detail, but we can absolutely arrange for our um, title company to representative to talk to them and explain and make them comfortable. Does that make, does that help? Just in terms of what you guys should kind of do with this information, obviously the buyer needs to receive it, right? So that's why when you put a deal under contract and they ask for all the buyer information, you need to get that to them as quickly as possible so that you're not the funnel of information, right? You, you, you need the title company to have all the buyer's contact information so that they can be communing, communicating with you and the buyer. Does that make sense? Does that, does, does that help Richard answer some of your gotcha questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay, moving on. Schedule C. This is like the clear to close schedule. The items that must be addressed and cured at close, at or before closing. So it's largely liens. Um, you know, assuming there's a mortgage on the house that the sellers have, it'll list that. If there's anything like a tax lien or something like that, that will be that will be shown as well. And then sometimes if there's been um, a divorce, they the you may be asked to bring like the divorce decree. To, to the closing as well. Yeah. So as the, as the listing agent, you want to look at this when the title company gets distributed, because you can see, you know, you can see item eight here says if the marital status is different than at the time of acquisition, that's what we were just talking about. Even if I own this as my separate property before I got married, if I get married and my husband and I live in this house, it's, um, it becomes, it, he has marital property rights in the property, even if I owned it before I met him. It's still separate property, but he has rights in it if we lived in it as our marital homestead. That's a, that's a nuance, but just things to be um, paying attention for. Sometimes you'll get like a crazy IRS lien and you're like, ooh, we were not expecting that, right? So um, that's another good thing if you're dealing with a seller and you don't know the seller very well, or you think there might be like financial challenges, you can always ask the title company to help you when they're, you know, confirming who the correct seller is to go ahead and pull title and see what's outstanding. Um, Cause the last thing you want to do is get it under contract to sell for a million dollars and they have a, they owe the IRS $1.2 million and they they're stuck. And usually you can fix those things and there are ways to negotiate and get them taken care of, but it just helps to be knowledgeable upfront. It will make you your deal easier. These things happen 2% of the time, but good to be aware of them. And then the final schedule is Schedule D, and that basically is a disclosure of parties that, you know, have an interest. So really kind of just, you know, all the officers of the title company. Yeah, it's just title company. Yeah. Well. Okay. Okay, so the survey. So, um, sorry, I'm having a hard time viewing or this is my issue. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the survey is... Um, the drawing that shows the property, you know, and the, the boundary lines and where, if there is a structure where that sits on, on the property, it will show fence lines and um, things like that, set, setbacks. So do you want to get, talk about that a little more, Zuri? Yeah, sure. So, so we're looking at two different surveys here, and this is typical of what you'll might get. The Merrimack survey is 
um, old. I can't I can't see exactly the date on it, but this is an a, it's a it's an old survey, and you can see it. It's kind of been it's been photographed and sent around several times. And then the one on the right is newer. You can see though, both of them are stamped by a registered professional surveyor, which you need to make it official. And these are also both platted lots. So these are, you know, lot one in a subdivision. This is lot 20 in a subdivision, right? If this is the, this is the specific lot is the address. And then the block is like the whole kind of strip of the neighborhood. So most of the properties that you're gonna be selling are platted lots. Sometimes they're, not plotted lots in their meets and bounds, and then they have every point around the property described. But usually this is what we're gonna be dealing with. So we just wanted you to kind of see what they look like. And you can see here, like in the survey on the right, there's a house and then there's um, a, a structure in the back and you can see it just as right, butts up right against the, the building setback line against the back property line. So you just wanna, you can kind of see, you can see where the fence is along the property line. You just wanna kind of take a look um, just, not much. Usually when you, you're reusing an old survey, a lot of the time, and if you can't find, if you have a listing and you can't find the survey, you can always see if the sellers remember where they closed because the title company will keep the survey and you can go back to wherever they closed when they purchased and see if you can request a copy. Um, my dog is outside my bedroom door barking. She wants to come in. So sorry if you can hear her. She's bad. Um, so this is the provision in the contract that deals with the survey and you see you can see it says you know that the survey must be made by a registered professional land surveyor like i said it has to have the stamp and typically you're going to check if you have a copy of the survey you're going to check box c1 then blank days after the effective date of this contract seller shall furnish to buyer and this is important the existing survey and a residential property app T47 affidavit. And so you take the existing survey and also the seller fills out this affidavit, which we're going to show you on the next page that says nothing has changed since the survey. These are the things that have changed the survey. It's basically this, the affidavit helps bring an old survey current because the seller is providing information. Um, please note what's in our bold and conspicuous language here in bold. If the seller fails to furnish the existing survey or the affidavit within the time prescribed, Buyer shall obtain a new survey at seller's expense no later than three days prior to closing. That's one you don't even have to argue about. If it's if you put three days and you deliver the survey, but not the T47, on the fourth day, the buyer's agent can call the title company and say, please order us a new survey. And there's just no arguing about that. And when you miss that as the agent, guess who's paying for the survey? <laughs> you are. And there are you know, Richard, usually... that's one. I made that mistake one time early in my yes. career. Yes. So yeah. And I bought a survey. So that's yeah, right. so that, that is Great. definitely a, yeah. That's an, and I will tell you, there are a lot of title companies and um, agents that say, oh, don't worry about it. You can just, we'll get the survey, the affidavit notarized at closing and you can provide it then. Do not do that. That's what, at Briggs Freeman, our best practice is to gather, you know, all of the listing paperwork, including the seller's disclosure and the survey upfront, partly for this reason. But the, the T47 is a pain. They have to fill it out and it's a little bit confusing and then they have to get it notarized. But they do have to be delivered before this date runs out, your X amount of days. Usually I put three to five in that blank. Um, it, perfect. In a perfect world, you just deliver it before. So... Question, is it not common that we obtain that as the listing agent ahead of time and add it as an attachment? To the yes, MLS? that's our best practice. That's what the best agents do. I mean, a lot of times sellers aren't thrilled about like going to get things notarized, but the title company can notarize it, their bank can notarize it, the, the ladies at our front desk are all notaries. Like there's a lot of options to get things notarized and it's better just to get this up front. Um, so then the next question is, you know, if the existing survey is not acceptable, if, if the title company is like, we can't read this, or this is too old, or the seller added a pool in a garage, and this survey doesn't indicate that, and we want a new survey, um, then you have to say who's going to pay for it. And that's a negotiable term. I mean, it, right now, you'd probably check buyer's expense because it's, you know, the, the seller's market that we're in. But just know survey, cost, go, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Can the no. survey be too old? I mean, basically, I mean, if, if a owner has a survey that, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago when he bought the home, should a new one be required or is that still acceptable? I mean, if, the, if they fill out the T47 and they say, I haven't made any changes and you can still read the survey, the, the title company and the lender may be fine with it. Um, if it's not legible or they say, you know, we've made all of these changes, then they may require a new one. Usually it's very rare. I would say that surveys get 
rejected. But typically, if the the if your client, if the sellers have added a pool or added a um, extension or something to the house, like they got a new survey when they did that anyway. So, and if it's a second generation survey, if it's a survey, then they can re they reject on that. So if it was a survey that your sellers bought used from when they bought the house from a previous seller. So because they can't attest to changes going okay, back. Okay, so that, that's good feedback. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So then, and then of course, you know, if there's no survey, you're saying either the buyer is going to obtain a new one or the seller is going to obtain a new one. I would just be mindful if you're writing an offer on behalf of your buyer, if you have a 10 day option, you don't want to put within three days because you don't want the buyer to buy a survey on a property they may not even like after the inspection. So just be mindful of what, how those dates match up. If you have a five day option, maybe put within seven days so that after the option is passed, you can then order the survey. Does that make sense? Pretty, pretty obvious, but just something and to be thinking about. Wise, I think they're running what, six, 700 for just a standard yeah, neighborhood lot right. just to give you, you know, because your clients will ask that question when you're checking the box. So yeah. yes, yeah. yes. And then this is another document that's really confusing to people how to fill it out. So as the agent, like, don't just hand it to them and be like, fill this out. You probably need to walk them through or even better be like, why don't you call, let me connect you with my title company and they'll explain to you how to fill this out if you're not totally comfortable. But, you know, you put the date, the GF number is the reference number that the title company uses. So you don't have to fill that out if you don't know it. It'll be on the title commitment. That's kind of what identifies your transaction. Um, and then, you know, the name of the person making the affidavit, the seller, their address, you know, the, the description of the property, you know, before me, undersigned notary state of Texas personally appeared the affiance. And this is what they're stating. They're stating one, that we're the owners of the property or, you know, we're the property manager or whatever. Usually they're the owners. So you don't fill anything in that blank. Two, we are familiar with the property and the improvements. Three, we are closing a transaction requiring title insurance. And the proposed insured owner or lender has requested area coverage. Um, and we understand the title company makes exceptions to the coverage as they deem appropriate. So we understand that um, we, we need to basically have an accurate statement of the, the condition of the property. So then you're stating to the best of our actual knowledge, since this date, there have been no construction projects, changes in the location of the fences, um, you know, construction projects on immediately adjacent properties or, you know, replattings, conveyance, easements, et cetera, et cetera, except. So that's the tricky one. It's like, what does that mean? So if you have the survey and then you, you added a pool in 2018, I would put since 2018, there have been no things except whatever, right? A good rule of thumb is just to put the date that they purchased the property and then below list any changes that they've made. So like we just sold a rental property for my mom and we didn't make any changes except that we swapped out the fence. So I put the date that we purchased the property in February of 2021 and then except um, seller replaced the fence in the same location. And the title company was fine with that, right? We just swapped out an old wood fence for a new wood fence and they weren't worried about it. They maybe could have been, but it was a lower price property. They maybe didn't care. So you just have to put any changes or since, you know, the date that we brought pro property, we haven't done any of these things except added a pool, added a garage, moved the driveway, like installed a carport, whatever. Just put the changes that you've made since you bought it. Does that help figure out how to fill that out? And then, of course, you just sign in and date it in front of a notary. And are you finding that they require, if it's okay, I've had people say, oh, it's okay if just, if it's a couple that owns it, if just one signs it, um, or do you need both? You know, it's a good question. I would try and get away with one signing it, but I would ask the title company there if they're going to be super sticklers. Honestly, yeah. they're so casual about these, which seems kind of crazy. Um, of course, if you only have one sign it and then you close and then down the line, there's some issue and it's something that you didn't close on the affidavit, that's a loophole, right? So in a perfect world, you have both people do it. Yeah. It's the just hard sometimes to, during the work day to get someone to come to the other, you know? And yeah. Do it. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've found that and had agents ask about that before. Yeah. And I mean, maybe you have one person sign it in front of a notary and then the other person does it at closing, Right. I well, know. that was great. Thanks for asking that because that question was in the back of my mind and I assumed that you'd have to get both of them. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, legally, it's better to have both because it's a disclosure basically, right? Because um, one may know something that the other doesn't. I don't know. 
Um, Arlene's asking, do you have to use the legal description for the address or just the street address? You can just use the street address. They just need to know it ties to this property. It's a good question. Okay. Hopefully that helps a little bit. So let's move on to the home warranty. Okay, so home warranty is a one-year service agreement that covers the repair or replacement of many home, many major home system components and appliances that break down over time due to normal wear and tear. Um, this may include coverage of electrical parts, plumbing, HVAC, and other appliances. Um, so the big question that, you know, it's important, especially if you're dealing with first time buyers and, you know, all this terminology is new to them, is to explain what the difference between a home warranty and home insurance is, because they're both insurance policies. But a home warranty, which is also called like a residential service policy, so you may hear that term too, it is to protect the home's systems from, like I said, normal wear and tear. Whereas a homeowner's insurance, that is for casualty, unexpected things like fires, tornadoes, you know, major, major um, pipe and pipe damage due, due to weather and storms. Um, so the, the little day-to-day -day stuff, you know, your HVAC goes out just because it's, 10 years old, that's when you would use the home warranty. So, and, you know, there's a blank in the contract where you can say if your buyer's going to ask the seller to purchase one. So, um, and that's a conversation you should have with them. In this market, again, we um, are trying to make our offers as favorable as possible to the seller. So probably less people are asking, but yet it is a good thing to, to have and a strategy you might consider um, using is whatever you were at an extra thousand, let's say it's a thousand dollars, which is kind of a, a, a decent range for probably a five to seven or eight hundred thousand dollar house. You know, put that thousand dollars in, but raise your offer by that thousand. So your client, your seller um, will be netting the same because it does give protection to you and protection to, to, to your buyer client and protection to the seller. So when two weeks after closing or one day after closing, as happens a lot, you know, something goes out, the water heater, the water heater busts or, you know, the oven breaks. So and then, so, you know, it's not mandatory again, but it is an extra level of protection. And, you know, we have all kinds of companies. You've probably already heard spiels from some of them as they come and, um, you know, present at our office huddles and whatnot, but it, it can offer a lot of value. Can they get it after closing? Like if they don't want to put it in the contract? I believe they can, Zareen, can't they? You can add one within, don't you have a certain amount of time, like one month you, or something? Yeah, like I think you can. So the tricky thing about home warranties is you just have to um, be mindful of, you know, they, that they say, oh, this was something that showed up in your inspection. So we're not covering it. So a lot of sellers, not necessarily in this market, get home warranties while the home warranty companies will offer like a free home warranty while you're listing to sell that can be transferred to the buyer. And that's a nice like perk to think of in a market when you become in a, a buyer's market, a lot of HOA companies will do that. You can put one in place and then just transfer it, of course, for a fee, you, then you do buy it. Um, and then there's continued coverage is what it's called. Um, you can put one in place after, like I could call and get one on this house right now, right? Uh, I don't know how, I mean, you just have to be careful. Home warranty companies are tricky because they're trying, I would say, not to cover things because it costs the money. But yes, you can get one after closing. I don't know the amount of time. We recommend, um, gosh, 10 to home warranty. That's kind of a more like luxury white glove home warranty service. So I think there's a link yeah, to it. They're out there. And always when you're recommending someone, send them a couple of names, you know, send them three names so you don't care aren't considered steering them somewhere. Yeah, so. I have a I have a template email. And in fact, I recommend that you create one that kind of gives a list. And then there's a website where people can go and like do some analysis. I'll share with the, everyone that's on this call. I'll share uh, 
that template after the fact, because that's just something you should have like in your, you know, buyer checklist is just a home warranty template email to just pass off to them so they can choose prior to closing. And then the title company will order it for you. You just tell them which one that you want. Good deal. Okay, so HOAs. HOAs is a homeowner association, sometimes they're referred to as property owner, um, property owner associations, um, which is an organization and a subdivision plan division plan community or condo that makes and enforces rules for the properties and their residents. And when we're talking about HOAs in this context, these are mandatory HOAs, you know, maybe a newer or gated community um, versus other communities. Let's say you're in an old neighborhood like Lakewood or something, and they have, you know, a voluntary one where you can pay $50 a year and you get the newsletter and whatever. These are, um, there are legal entities that, you know, can enforce mandatory payments and, and everything. So, and it's important when you're dealing with, with them to make sure your clients really know what all the rules and regs are, um, because a lot of things, there's a lot of, um, exterior maintenance that may be required. There may be only like, you know, certain colors you can paint your trim. You can't, you maybe can't have a, a boat trailer or something in front of the house. I had a client move once because she was not in an HOA community and the neighbors across the street put a trampoline in the front yard and just she just couldn't handle it and was decided it was time to live in an HOA community because she did not want the quote unsightly trampoline. So, um, but what you have to do when you're working with HOAs, um, there is an amendment or addendum rather, and that's on the next page um, that you, and similar to delivering um, the survey and the seller's disclosure, um, it is best to try to get this information if you can before with the subdivision information, which are the, the CCNRs, which are like covenants, um, covenants, conditions, and restriction. That's what really lays out the rules um, from when the subdivision was created. So because if you are, it says in the contract that within three days after receiving the subdivision information, the buyer can cancel. And that is a very broad canceling. It's not like they can cancel because they don't like something in there. They can use it and people do use it. If you know, you're past, you don't in this at market, we're having people without option periods or ex crazy, um, crazily short option periods. This is a way out. So if you are representing a buy a seller, if you have a listing, it is um, really wise to go ahead and get the, the subdivision information um, up front and you can give it to the buyer in when conjunction or before execution of the contracts because that is a big out. Can I ask a, a kind of a naive question just because yeah. I, this has exposed my lack of experience with this, but like I was helping Gavin uh, with a listing and then there's, you know, there's an issue of transfer uh, from the, there's a, like a transfer fee from yes. the HOA and then there's getting the documents and then there's the amount of time that the HOAs are kind of dilly dallying around and charging premiums. And can you unpack that a little bit? What's the sequence of what I, what I have to worry about? So I, you know, in other words, can I get the HOA stuff I need to disclose up front and they, they shouldn't be able to charge me anything. I just had not gone through that transaction. They, they will charge, the HOA will charge for copies of the documentation from day one, and then they will very likely charge a transfer fee. I've run into that before in Frisco. Gold Creek Ranch charges you on both sides, and there's really no way around that. It. It's it's a mandatory fee in their in their eyes. It does it become a um, a timing issue too? You know, um, in other words, do do you need? Some were saying, okay, we'll expedite, but it's still going to take a week or blah, blah. Does that all need to be done before you even get the listing up so forth? It's smart if you do it. Yeah. So. 
you have to be strategic, right? So this, I mean, it's an out for the buyers. If an agent calls me and they're like in a pickle and trying to figure out how to terminate, like one of the first questions I ask is, is it an HOA and have the documents been delivered? Because if not, it's an automatic blanket, any excuse to get out. So um, if you are a good idea, especially in this market, when you know things are going to sell quickly, is to go ahead and order at the resale certificate and have the documents in hand so that you can just deliver them and say, check box A3, buyer has received and approved and does not require an updated resale certificate. They do expire after it's either 30 it's or 90, 90. days. Yeah. So the re, not, the, not the documents, of course, but the resale certificate, because the resale certificate is a report that says, are there any outstanding assessments? Are there any lawsuits? What's the balance of the you know, funds? So you, um, that's, that's kind of evolving information. The documents themselves, unless they're amended, are usually pretty straightforward and don't change. So that's why you would need, if you had ordered them when you first listed and the property sat on the market for four months, you may have to get an update to the resale certificate. And I mean, the title, the HOA companies will charge you a few hundred dollars to deliver these documents. So the title company will order it. The title company will usually ask you or your seller for a credit card upfront. Most title companies do that. Some title companies will just pay for it, which is really nice and then get paid back at closing and they'll eat the cost if the deal doesn't close. That's like what a nice, good title company will do. Most of them, I would say, don't do that. So let me clar let me clarify. So it's still the sequence is just a little blurry to me. So, so the seller doesn't actually order it. I, I heard you talk about well, the title company. So the seller has to select the title company and get a title company to order it. I mean, Sorry you, if I'm you, making this you know the HOA company. You can reach out and order it directly. Most yeah. title companies will do it for you as a courtesy. They'll look it up and figure it out for you. Um, okay. That's why you need your whole good team in place that can kind of work with you and know how you operate. That's why what Angela was saying, some some sell, some listing agents only close with certain people because they know how they work. They know what they're willing to do for them. They kind of do things in, a, in advance. So you, you could order it directly if you know the HOA contact information, but the title companies will, you know, usually track it down and order it for you. Does and that then help? And you can also, once you have the documents, you can talk to the HOA and say, what are the transfer fees so that you don't put in this box C here, you don't put, you know, as the listing agent, if the buyer just writes in $100 and it's a $2,000 transfer fee, seller's paying $1,900, right? So as the listing agent, you want to know what the transfer fees are so that that box C is filled out. You know what to negotiate for that box. Well, I just experienced, I just watched this thing firsthand become a little bit of a, you know, a speed bump in the deal. Yep. So, yep. Okay. Yeah, because the seller, like Zareen said, like on C, fees and deposits for reserves that you put in the amount and buyer pays for the first whatever number you put in there and the rest goes to seller. So as a seller, you want to make sure, you know, that number is amped up a, a lot. So you're not going to be hit, you know, like they put in $100 and it's 2000, going to be $2,000 and you know, 1900 is going to be charged to the seller. And then another thing, B, above material change, we're seeing a lot of it um, with, there are so many things going on in terms of trying to restrict Airbnbs and VRBOs that maybe in the, in the subdivision information, it's not prohibiting that, but we've had several calls from people who have been dealing with properties that, you know, like, let's say, you know, they haven't updated the CCNRs, you know, in several months or a year, but they had a meeting two weeks before where they are voting to, to limit, you know, the, either altogether or their percentage of, of those. So be careful of that, um, you know, to make sure that if you have the sellers that if they know about it, um, because you don't want them to be accused of concealing anything. And if you have the buyers to, to ask, ask the question about, you know, has, what, what has happened, you know, recently in terms of your meetings. Yeah. And I mean, if there's any changes, you have to let your buyers know for sure. For sure. For sure. Okay. Does that help this, this document can be really tricky for people and, and it helps to understand how to fill it out. Do you guys feel good about this now? Thumbs up. Ish. Okay. All right. We'll keep moving. Okay. 
Okay, next is third party financing. And I know that last week Zareen went over this um, and then I did it again on Monday. How do y'all feel? And we've only got like 15 minutes left. Do you want to just kind of skip this or just briefly go through it instead of, you know, talking hard about what do y'all think? I'm good. Okay. You're good. I think the most yeah, important thing to it. remember in paragraph two is that there, the time frame that you put in there attaches to buyer approval, but it does not attach to property approval. 2A has a time limit attaching to buyer approval. 2B does not have a time limit other than it has to happen three days prior to closing. That's an important nuance. I think we're good. Just make sure you walk through with somebody and have somebody review it before you. Uh, yeah, get, right. Get yeah, just there. reach out, reach out to us or your your managers. I'm happy, happy to do that one. And, you yeah. know, y'all have mentors too. So, yeah. And same, same too with this document. Angela just went over that one. So we'll keep. We'll keep going. Right. Okay. okay. Let's talk about um, negotiating an offer. Okay. So kind of contract law. Um, verbal or written counter offers are acceptable. So if, you know, always a offer is presented with a written, you know, contract and Sometimes the buyer will, I'm sorry, sometimes the seller will choose to respond to it by, um, you know, marking up the contract, changing the price and other terms. Sometimes if they think it might take a couple of rounds, they may do it by phone or email or text. Say, okay, yeah, we like your offer, but we want to change it, you know, from six to 620 and close on the fourth instead of the sixth things like that. So that is acceptable. Of course, before it's finalized, it must be, you know, the contract form must be, um, must be properly changed and signed off on and initialed with every change by both parties. Um, but um, the, and one thing that a great document is the seller's invitation to buyer to submit new offer. So this is a rejection. It is not a count. It is a rejection. And it says that the seller is free to consider other offers. So this is a good document that can be used when you get multiple offers and you want to um, respond back to several of them because you can, it's, it specifically says on number one, the seller does not accept the above referenced offer you submitted. And it says you are invited to submit another offer, which can seller may consider more favorably if, and you could put pro, you could put whatever you want. You could put, you know, price above such and such. You could set, say, you know, um, you know, 60 day lease back, um, you know, such and such title company. And th this form you can send to different, to multiple people because it's not, it's, it's not an offer. So they can't sign off on this because you can't, you know, if you're actually negotiating a contract as a buyer, as a seller, you can't respond back to two different buyers because what if they both um, accept what you have, have presented and now you're under contract to sell the same single house two times. So um, this, this is a good form that probably isn't used as much as it should be. Right. I have a question really quick, if you don't mind. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? It's Sarah. Yeah. Go, hey, go okay. Um, on that form that you just had. Okay. So I'm going to do a quick little rundown on the listing that I just sold. Um, I had six offers mm -hmm. and um, I had like a best and final situation in like, I don't know what's customary. If you want to start to um, like counter with people um do you do that with like your high ones or do you just pick your pick one and then start working a deal that way like you're not supposed to have six ongoing negotiations right that's complicated so your duty is to treat everyone the uh, same yes. fairly and equally yes. right so i mean you obviously can't take the six offers that you think are good and like write on them and counter back because if they all executed you'd be in big trouble yeah so yeah. one that, that, that's what this document could be used for you could say you're invited to submit an offer which you're more favorably considering just list it out price above this cash preferred closing before this 60 day lease back you know no ho no warranty buyer you know just list the terms that you'd want and then you could send it to everyone 
you just have to be mindful of the fact that you're rejecting everyone's offer. Right. So if they're all like, well, that's crazy. I'm not doing that. Then you might have no offers, which in this market is not going to happen, but in other markets, you have to kind of be, be careful. That's probably the clearest way to do it, that you're being fair with everyone. Right. Right. Because you can't, I mean, you, or you can just pick one to negotiate. One, yeah. Yeah. Pick yeah. One That's and, what I did. Yeah. And yeah. then the, the sort of the second place guy really thought that he wrote this like award-winning contract. And when I told him, um, so our first deal went through, so this is the second negotiation. Um, and he didn't get it again. And he was real salty with me. And he was like, well, why didn't you counter my offer? And I was like, because we went with somebody else, I'm not going to counter five different offers, but he like really gave me a hard time. And I just thought, I was like, I need to ask this because I wouldn't think that we're supposed to be countering back and forth with a bunch of people. If we took 700 cash rather than 695 finance, like there's a reason for that. Right. But he gave me so much crap. And so I was like, dang. I guess we could have, but I just didn't want to like, that gets a little tricky. Well, I mean, also when you're in highest and best, like, dude, bring your highest and best. That's the thing. I asked him three times. I was like, you haven't budged. You've been 695 this whole time. And he was like, well, we would have gone up. And I was like, but I asked you to do that. Yeah. Well, he was just being mean. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, people are just frustrated in this market. So everyone deserves a little bit of grace, but that's annoying. So I'm sorry. You didn't yeah, no, I just wanted to talk about oh, it. Right like, there. Yeah. Did I make a mistake? Should yeah, I have yeah. like pursued? No, you chose, you chose the best offer and yeah. went, went with that. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. So yeah, you know, different, different strategy. Yeah, Dexter. With that form that was just up, do we connect with you for good legal language or we can write the things you were just saying just it's put, just terms you just put okay. the dollar amount you know it's if it's okay, just cool. terms and everything you want you know closing on this date and you know this price and cash and all of that that's good so again be careful if you are you can counter and negotiate over text and email but be careful um you know if people will say we have a deal or something and then you know Really this happens at least that. once a quarter where, like, where an agent will be in a panic because they'll be like, we were going back and forth and we said that that sounded good, but we never said we had a deal and my, my clients haven't signed. So please, whenever you get to a point, if you're texting back and forth, say, you can, and you, you, you get to an agreement, you can say, this sounds great. Once we have everyone sign off on it, we'll be under contract. Just include that sentence, include a reference to the fact that the parties need to sign off on it and then you have a deal, right? You don't want to just say we have a deal because there is case law in Houston where the agent bound their client over text. So be careful. You have to say, once the parties sign off, we'll be good to go. But these terms are great. Does that make sense? It happens. And then the agent has like a heart attack until we get it worked out. So just don't do that to yourself. Okay, withdrawing an offer or a counter offer. This can be done ver- verbally, but, but again, best to do in writing. And there is an actual form for this called the notice of withdrawal of offer. So this is a smart form to use. Um, and a lot of it's a relatively new form and a lot of people don't know about it. But, you know, so just because you don't want to have multiple offers out, out there, um, if you're trying to um, if you're trying to sell a property and this can be done either way, you can check buyer seller both ways. So just, and, it, and guys, if you're on the go, but you need to withdraw an offer, like say you're going back and forth and you're, you you, you represent the seller. This happened to me. We, I was on a plane and we were negotiating back and forth and I had sent my seller had finally agreed. I had sent it, um, to her, what, what, what was the, what was the exact terms? I had sent it to the, we had, we had sent the counter to the buyer and the buyer just needed to sign, sign it, send it back to us. And then we were under contract and I got off the plane and I had a better offer sitting in my inbox. So I called my, I was on a plane to San Francisco. I called my client, like running down the jetway. And she's like, yeah, I don't want, I would rather take this better offer. So I immediately sent an email to the buyer's agent on the first offer and said, we rescind our, our counter offer. And then I called her and explained, and she's like, well, that's not fair. I have it signed. It, we, we're under contract. I have it signed. And I'm like, we're not under contract until you send it back to me. And you haven't done that. So we ended up getting into a multiple offer situation. My seller made like $25,000 more 
from the first buyer, they ended up coming up, but that was a $25,000 mistake that that agent made by not sending it back. And I, the first thing I did before I even called her was sent it in writing. And I didn't have time to fill out this form. I just sent her an email saying where yeah. we're sending our counter offer um, or withdrawing our counter offer. And that pulled it off the table because if she had signed it and sent it back to me, it would have been under contract and nothing we can do. So just be strategic. This is a great form if you have time to use it. If you don't, just send an email. And, and I always say, put it in writing first and then call them because if you call them, they can do it while they're on the phone with you. Does that make sense? This is getting really strategic, but it's important. No, right. this is really good stuff. Good, <laughs> good. Yeah. Hey, so you you haven't gotten to it yet. Let me. I just want to park a little thing because I, I'm seeing you using Texas Realtor forms, and I'm in the middle of the GR, GRI course. And there's another one that sounds like a lot of people are using. It's a little bit out of context for here, but is the 2502 notice of information from other sources. And so I don't want to derail this conversation, but I'm hopefully before the end of the class, you can comment whether that's something Briggs people are using um, to, to deal with. Honestly, know. I'm not super familiar with that form. Angela, are you? No, I know what it is. And it, you could be, do it. You know, we have our own form for square footage that we've developed here at Briggs. You it, know, this just, is like appliances, all sorts of stuff. One, one thing about the GR, GRI course is you leave it scared to death. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, I mean, there was a healthy conversation. Here's some tools to keep you out of the cracks and whatever. But yeah. that says a lot when this crew doesn't even use it much. That's kind of what I was trying to calibrate. I guess and I'm like sorry it's a CYA for form. Just a, it's more a general version of our um, square footage form, but it's just kind of, yeah, like a CYA that we're not saying that we think this is correct. If you have a client that you think is kind of squirrely and they're saying, like, oh, no, I promise this is this you could maybe use this form. Just, it's good to be aware of it for sure. Okay, sorry, sorry to distract oh, it's you. Good. It's good, Please it's good. Go okay, okay, no worries. Okay, so um, crossing out terms in the form. So, um, you know, these are promulgated forms um, produced by TREC in conjunction with lawyers. And so we're supposed to use these. And as, as non-lawyers, um, you are not supposed to be scratching them out or writing legal language. But if you have a client who specifically directs you to, to mark something out, then you need to have that documented. Have them write it to you in an email. I want you to strike out the, you know, such and such provisions. So a lot of times attorneys will say, I want you to strike out specific performance and say, great, I'll just put that to me in an email and then you can do it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing if, if your clients want you to write something into the contract. We're not attorneys, so we can't draft language. But if the client says, I want you to write this in, then you can do that. You just need it in an email and you would be protected. Yeah, I had an agent come to me earlier this week and her client, he wasn't an attorney, but he was in commercial real estate, wanted to write. It was like a huge, giant paragraph. So when I, you know, made sure she had it all, all in there too. Um, to make sure she's got it because we have a Trek complaint going on right now with an agent who wrote something pretty innocuous into the contract and didn't affect the contract at all, but they're just being jerks on the other side and decided to, you know, narc on her and she's just having to deal with, um, with, with a Trek and a tar complaint. So yeah, be, be careful. Yeah. And in that case, the language that was written, like her clients told her what to write, but it's terrible language. And I will tell you, the agent on the other side and our agent both and the parties all thought it was great language and was very clear what they meant. And then once we got into the transaction, there was like huge issues about it. Ultimately, the transaction closed and it was fine. But it just goes to show like if you're not a lawyer, you should not be drafting things. And these the agents aren't lawyers and the parties weren't lawyers here either. And it was a big old mess for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, closing day extension. So as we all know that sometimes a loan can take longer than is initially promised. So what happens if you have a closing date and you know the loan documents are gonna be two days, a week, whatever, late. If the closing day is going to be missed, you can um, amend the contract to extend the closing date um, or 
if a seller is going to be, you know, total hard ass for lack of a better term, they can try to declare the buyer in default. Um, however, there is some question because unlike some paragraphs of the contract, like delivery of option and earnest money, um, it's not a time is of the essence clause. But you know what we're we're seeing? So many contracts right now have backups, and the backup may have come in later and be stronger than the than the initial primary contract that a, a seller could push for that. So if, you know, again, it's always important to, if you are representing a buyer to keep in communication with the lender, making sure they're on track. And if you see this coming to start, you know, wait, you know, not wait until the day before um, closing to address this, you know, if a week out, it's looking like it's going to be late, you know, start saying, hey, can we move the closing date to such and such date? Yeah. And so guys, this is where you have to be strategic. And I just want to clarify because a lot of times agents are like, oh, well, they missed the closing date. Like the contract is void or it's not valid anymore. Like that's not true. We just missed the closing date. And, you know, the party that missed the closing date may or may not be in default. And there, if you get in a situation where, you know, your buyer is supposed to close Thursday, but they're not going to be ready to close until Friday, the seller can't say, oh, you, you can't close. Like we're moving on to our backup contract. There's a very, very helpful TAR FAQ. If you get in this, in this situation, ask me and I'll send it to you. That says like, you know, the, the buyer or, the, or the, the party that's unable to close on time is allowed a reasonable amount of time to close, right? Because it's not of the essence. So is a day late reasonable? Maybe. Is two days late reasonable? Maybe. Is a week? Mm, maybe not. I mean, that's a question for a court of law, but um, you do have a little bit of wiggle room and it's not like the contract automatically voids itself or anything like that. So you just have to be, and you have to be strategic on the seller side. If, if your buyer's coming at you and saying, can I have more time, but you have a better backup contract, you can say no, because the sooner they don't close on time, the sooner they're in default. Right. So you just have to be strategic there. How, 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 how much leverage do they really have, uh, Zareen and Angela? I mean, okay, let's just say you've got a pain in the rear seller, you know, who's just, I mean, what lever do they really have within a few days? So what I would say is if you were supposed to close on Friday and your buyer can't close until Tuesday and you're asking for an extension and the seller and the listing agent say, no, we're not giving you extension, then you just kind of have to wait it out and get your lender to hustle and get those documents done as quickly as possible. And on Tuesday, show up to closing and say, you know, we're ready, willing and able to close and we have performed. And then the seller is in default, right? Because then you're going to get into a lawsuit about whether those three days was reasonable or not, which you're not going to do. So that's that's what you do. You you get it done as quickly as possible and you show up and you perform and, and put the default on them. Does that make sense? I mean, there's no there's no automatic promise that that's going to work, but it's really hard to argue if you're if you were if you showed up with everything you needed to do like three days later that that's unreasonable but if you no problem i'm not a court of law does that does that help does that answer your question guys it's so here's the deal it's 10 if you need to drop off feel free um if you want CE credit, put your name into the chat. Angela, I have time to keep going if you do. And if these guys want to stick around, no, I'm I don't good. Want to force anyone. Okay, cool. Sorry, I think we spent a lot of time at the beginning on our title. Covering our, yeah. Do you guys have any questions about anything we've talked about so far? How are we doing? No, it, it's good. It's good. All right. Good We're deal. still here and you're at the end of time. That says a lot. All right, good. We'll take it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Effective date. Um, effective date is the date the last of the two parties signs and delivers the contract to the other party. And Zareen was talking about this, the delivery and communication um, in another situation, but there's a great, this example down here is another T from TAR. So let's walk through this um, with the dates. Um, so the example says a buyer makes a written offer through his agent to the listing agent on May 15th. The listing agent delivers the offer to the seller on May 16th. 
the seller signs the offer as submitted on May 17th and delivers the offer to the listing agent on May 18th. The listing agent emails the executed contract to the buyer's agent on May 19th and the buyer's agent calls the buyer on May 20th and informs the buyer that the seller has accepted the offer. What do you think the effective date of the contract is? Wait, Richard, you said something, but you're muted. 20th, right? It's when they inform. Anyone else? Well, hold on. May 17th and delivers the sign. No. Oh, no, to the listing agent, 18th. That's correct. It's yeah, the, sorry, it's listing the, the effective date would be May the 19th because that's when the listing agent emails it to the buyer's agent because the buyer, the agent is the it's the buyer's agent. He's an agent of the buyer. So it has been delivered, you know, yeah. to the, the, the buyer party. So yeah. that's exactly right. So, but even though it was signed, so it was signed, um, you know, on the 17th, but it took two days to get to the buyer side. So it's going so to So the, the standard is signed and conveyed, right? Con yes, with the con conveyed. and deliver. Delivery is the final component. Yes. Delivery to the other side, right? So like, like in my airplane jetway example, the agent was so mad because she's like, I have all the paperwork signed, like we're under contract. And I'm like, you may have it all signed, but if you never gave it to us, like we don't, we're not under contract. Delivery is the final component. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of filling out the, the box, um, it is best for the agent who is the, the one, the last one to receive it, to fill it out. Now, sometimes you'll get a contract. Let's say in this example, the seller signed it on, signed it on the 17th. He could have put in the 17th but you get this contract when you finally get the contract um, on the 19th, um, you realize that you need to raise that right, uh, you know, right up front and, you know, let the other side know, let the title company know and, and change that date. So you're, you're working off of the 19th and not. Yeah. Sure. If there's any question that you're not on the same page, like, like deal with it up front while you're still excited you're under contract and not when you're like already negotiating repairs and are super mad. So okay. always address that up front if there's any question. I did a deal recently and the title company emailed a critical dates list and the option, you know, the good title company will send you like these are the critical dates and their option date was wrong. And I immediately was like, hold the phones, everybody, just to be clear, like this is the option expiration date, just to make sure we were all on the same page. So, Zareen, in your example, you would have been the one to sign the final acceptance when you received the document from the other broker, correct? Um, no, because we had, we, this, the buyer had submitted an offer. We had marked it up with the terms we wanted and sent it back to them. So, all that was up was left was for them to initial the changes that we had made. And then we would be under contract as soon as they sent it back. So, there would be nothing for me to do once I received it. it presumably that yeah, listing, like you would have filled in the, the dates though, right? Well, yeah, the buyer's yeah. agent. If yeah. like it, like if if yeah. I if, if if I sit down with my buyer, I send it in DocuSign and we initial all the changes, and I'm like, I'm gonna send this back today, I would put the date in and send it back to her. Okay. Or, I guess I guess that's where I'm kind of getting a little confused because you said. It had been signed, but not communicated or sent back to you. And that to me is creating a little bit of a vague. Yeah. Area. So, yeah. So I was the listing agent representing the seller and the buyer's agent sat down with the buyer and they signed off on all of our changes. So she had it in hand, right? She just never delivered it to, to our side, to the seller side. So there was nothing left. Would have, even though she would have texted you or communicated it had been signed because she has not provided the copies back to you, it would not be a valid contract. It, well, she never communicated that it was signed. Okay. In your example, like if she had texted me, like we're all signed, we're good to go, but hadn't sent it to me, we pro she probably would have had a better argument that we were under contract. I still, of course, would have argued like I didn't receive the signed paperwork back, so we're not. But even if she had said like, we're all signed up. I'll be dropping it off at your office later today or something like that. She would have had a better argument that we were under contract, but she hadn't communicated at all that it was fully signed. Okay, thank you. That Does that help? Perfect. 
And so either party on the date of delivery, it doesn't matter who fills in the date, as long as we both agree that this was the date it was delivered. She could have filled it out and sent it back to me on that day, or I could, she could have sent it back to me blank and I could have filled it out. I received it on this day for the event. She would have some pissed off clients and I get that. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. I think we beat that date that to death. Okay, so why is the effective date so important? Because most of the key dates, when you, that's what you start counting from, right? When you start counting from um, the option period and the delivery dates for for you know the the survey, the HOA docs, et cetera. So yeah, yeah. And so what what should we do with this information? And this is something I just mentioned. I don't know if a lot of agents do it, but this was something I learned as a baby lawyer. As soon as I get something under contract, I calculate all the critical dates and I put them into my calendar so that I. I'm watching, but so create a critical dates timeline. A good title company will do this for you. But again, you saw what just happened to me. You need to make sure that you know the dates and you're not just trusting what the title company says. So always double check. And I think um, one of the templates that Zareen has is is a is a an email to a client letting them yeah. know the letting them know the timeline. So they're yes. they're aware too, just yes. keeping them up to speed and aware. Okay, any ideas on how to track your critical dates? I'm getting ahead of myself. Put them into your calendar um, and then write your client an email upfront with the dates and then remind them as the dates approach. I mean, this is our job as the their representative that does this all the time when they only do this a couple of times a year. It's our job to manhandle the critical dates, which means making sure that, you know, the survey gets ordered on time, making sure that the lenders being mindful of that date in 2A, like it's our job to manhandle the dates and just gently nudge people to make sure things are getting done on time. Okay, so now on to section five, option and earnest money. Yes, so option and earnest money within three days of the effective date, buyer must deliver to the title company, the escrow agent, um, the earnest money and the option money. So um the earnest money is usually one percent in this market maybe more of the purchase price and then the option fee i mean it used to be a couple hundred dollars it's getting higher and higher um and the option fee at the option period gives the buyer the free look period in which they can you know have a right an unrestricted right to cancel get their inspection done think about it so um, but it, this is, you can see at the very end of this paragraph, time is of the essence for this paragraph and strict, compli strict compliance with the time for performance is required. So um, unlike the closing date uh, section, this, it is imperative that you get it to the title company on time and title companies close 5, 530, whatever. So that's really the day. Now, if it's if the third day, so day three when it's due, falls on a weekend or a holiday, um, then the money is due at the title company the next business day. So, so if you if you execute a contract on a Thursday, right? So day one would be Friday, Saturday's two, Sunday's three. So in that situation you would have to deliver it on Monday by end of the business day on Monday. Now, if you executed the contract on Friday, so then Saturday, Sunday, Monday, even though you've got weekends involved, the title company is open on day three and it's also due on Monday. Does that make sense? Okay, and here's a, here's a horror story for you guys. We had an agent mix up the blanks where she put $10,000 for option money and $1,000 for, for, for earnest money. And they canceled the contract and they played hardball and she ended up having to, having to eat that amount. So be very careful the way it's written. Um, this contract was re this section of the contract was redone um, a little over a year ago and it's um, all smushed in there. So just make sure you are putting the amounts in the right blank. Any questions about this, guys? We get calls all the time from agents about like, 
holidays and you know does you, time it, of i'm sorry go ahead go ahead does time of day count for day one so if i finalize a contract on a thursday evening at let's say five or six p.m does that count as day one or does friday count as day one the next day is always the day one, whether you sign it, you know, on Thursday at 6 a.m. or at 11.58 p.m. Okay, thank you. That was my no. So, yeah, so whatever, if the effective date is today, the 22nd, then tomorrow the 23rd is day one for counting purposes. Okay. You don't That's count great. the date of execution. You don't count the effective date. All right, thank you. No, no problem. And then if you need to, so if you, okay, delivery of the option fee. Um, so if you don't deliver the option fee, the contract still exists, but you don't have your option period. So that's that's very important. So, and then if they are late delivering the the earnest money, the seller can cancel at any point up into until that earnest money is delivered. If um, let's say they don't deliver it till the sixth day. Um, and you know the then the seller gets an offer. Okay, day three's passed. Um, you know, and it hasn't been delivered. The seller can cancel the contract. That's one of the few situations where the seller can cancel. So, but let's say you know they still haven't canceled, and the buyer doesn't have anything else going on, and they deliver it on day six, and you know the title company accepts it because they haven't been told to not accept it by the seller. Then the contract continues forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, the, the reason that, that we put that provision, that, that they added that provision is because there used to be investors that would write contracts and put in $1,000 earnest money, and then they'd never deliver the earnest money. And it, it would be like a week into the contract, and they haven't delivered the earnest money. And you're like, well, are we under contract or are we not? Like, what's going on here? So they added that, that gives the seller, if the buyer doesn't deposit their earnest money, the seller now has the right to terminate because the buyer is not performing and you're otherwise like in contract limbo and you don't know if the buyer's intending to perform or not. So um, that's why they added that. But it's a race, right? If you're, if it's day five and the buyer hasn't deposited their earnest money, the seller has the right to terminate. But if the buyer deposits the earnest money, even on day seven and the seller hasn't terminated, then the contract goes through. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the option fee is gone no matter what right right yes okay that you never get the option fee back yeah right. you, you know i thought when i went through my training that it it did get credited to the deal it yes it, it does is. it does but if you cancel the contract okay it's okay, okay okay yes, yeah I'm exactly sure. yeah okay so if you do need to extend the option which happens very regularly you know you're waiting for um a contractor to come out or something, um, you can address that in the amendment to contract, which is on the next page, but it is imperative that the buyer pay some type of consideration. I mean, it can be a super small amount, um, you know, $10, arguably even a dollar, um, but you need to make sure that is actually paid or um, it's not considered valid. So, and I think we're finding, you know, this was a big change when we started paying the option funny money directly to the title company instead of directly to the seller, which is how it had been for years and years. But I think most people, when we are extending the option fee, I'm seeing our usering that they are just paying that direct instead of dealing with the title company for that, they're just paying it directly to the to, yeah. to the seller. Yeah. And I mean, guys, as a, as an attorney, I cannot stress enough how important it is to pay this additional $5. Even if you take $5 and you're, you know, you leave it at the house and take a photo of it and send it to the listing agent and say, we delivered, you know, the $5 additional option fee to the house. It's just legally in Texas. If you don't pay for your option, you don't have one. So you need to put some additional consideration down. And if it's the easiest, send it through Stockholm, send it through Venmo, leave $5 at the house and take a photo and send a proof, right? Then you've done something to buy that additional time. Exactly. And then back to the amendment page, um, which is on the next slide. Um, this is an important one. It's so, and this one has gotten 
it hasn't gotten me before, but I know it witnessed it and it made the seller super mad. And that was totally the agent's fault where, you know, this is the amendment, you know, if you're changing the sales price, you can put this here. Um, you know, when you are doing any repairs, you can say seller at seller's as expense shall repeat the following repairs. I always, if you're writing an amendment, reference the inspection, say we'll complete the repairs recommended in section 2A5B on page seven of the inspection report dated, whatever. Then it's unambiguous and you don't have to send the listing agent the whole report if you don't want to do that or you think that's like a jerky thing to do. But you can snip at least the relevant pages of where you're asking for a repair so that it's unambiguously clear what you're asking for. Um, that's, that's how I recommend that you request repairs. The, the nice thing about doing it that way too is as, as a listing agent or as the buy side, we can upload all of that stuff to punch list and get an estimated repairs of what it's gonna cost. So for me, use, not using punch list with respect to repairs on either the buyer seller side is crazy because it's so easy. Okay, hold on. Say, say more about punch list. I think I've heard about this before. If yeah. that's a separate conversation. It's got its own wait. square on BF Office. And punch list is basically a company. It was invented by a realtor and a general contractor together. And basically, um, what you can do is you can take your inspection report. And because we're Briggs Freeman, we have a special deal with them. You upload it to punch list if you get to them through our website. And within one business day, they will turn it around and have every item listed in the inspection report priced out. And it's on Engage cost. or uh, BF Office. 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 It's, it's BF Office. Office. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. They'll, and, they, they, and they'll do the work. Fundamental questions, so. Yeah, and they'll do the work. So I just had this on that little listing of my mom's I sold. I told you the buyer's agent, they requested five repairs and they didn't send me the whole inspection report, but they sent me the pages that referenced those repairs. So I went to punch list and I'd never done it before. And I uploaded the amendment, their written repair request, and then those five pages. And within the next morning, I had priced out every single repair and I could choose which ones I agreed to do. Like I had my handyman do two of them because they weren't things that required a license, but there was an HVAC issue and a plumbing issue. And I just engaged punch list to do it and they did it and they sent an invoice and it got paid at closing. And it was like the easiest thing. So do they have to, do they go on site? Do they, are they able to get in the house or do we have to look Yeah, I mean, them? they'll make the repairs. They don't. No, but, uh, before they quote it. No, they, yeah, they, they do they an do estimate. Like, wow. And on my plumbing repairs, they were like, we think it's this much. Um, it may be different when we get there, but it wasn't different when they got there. So I think okay. it's really valuable. Sorry, that's a rabbit hole. Um, okay, so paragraph three, the date in paragraph nine, that's the closing date. So if you're changing the closing date, paragraph four, 12A1B is the seller credit to buyer. So if I had, if I had, if that, I had got that repair request and I didn't want to do any repairs, I but I could have itemized what they cost. And it was like $800 worth of repairs or something. I could have just said the date and uh, the amount in paragraph 12A1B has changed to $900 and gave the buyer a $900 credit so that they could have that work done, right? A lot of times you do that. You just have to be mindful because that amount is capped with the buyer's loan. You can't say $20,000 on a $100,000 house. It can, if the buyer is getting a loan, there's a limit to how much cash they can get back that, basically covers their cost. They can't get extra cash into their pocket. So the lender can help you fill out that dollar amount if you're getting to be a pretty substantial one. I think it's, I think it's 3% on conventional. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, three or three and a half, uh, yeah. But ask the lender, they can calculate that number exactly for you. Okay, so then five deals with lender required repairs. Um, Six is to extend the option like we were just talking about. So an additional option fee of, I would say $5 or $10. Um, to extend the option. And then seven, and this is where we originally started. This is the buyer waives the right to the unrestricted right to terminate. So if you are, if you, if you're a listing agent and you get this extensive repair request on day five of a seven day option and the seller's like, okay, fine, we'll do it. You want to make sure that this box is checked too, because that ends the option. You're basically saying we're agreeing to do these things and we're ending the option. So you want box seven to be checked. And I mean, as a buyer's agent too, you don't need to be tricky. Like if this is what you're asking for the, in the option, say, this is what we're asking for. And if you agree to it, we'll waive the remainder of our option. So that's what that means. Don't forget to check that box. I had a friend once as, that was a seller and 
their agent agreed to all of these repairs without checking this box. So then the buyer came back for round two of repair requests and they had the option. So be careful. Um, okay, this is if your buyer needs more time to get their financing approved is paragraph eight. And then paragraph nine is anything else you would write in. Any questions there? I have a question. Sure. Um, what would you use section one for if the sales price was changing? If it like if it didn't appraise, if they yeah, if you're amending the price, so like you may say uh, this is a five hundred thousand dollar house and it needs like thirty thousand dollars worth of repairs because it needs foundation, but the seller doesn't want to do the foundation, so it's like okay, fine, let's just change the price to five seventy, right? Okay, and then you would just put the new amounts there. The issue if you do that, obviously the buyer's not getting that amount of cash in their pocket; they're only getting because they're still financing some of it, right? It's not a direct fix, but sometimes parties like to do that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, cool. Okay, good question. Okie doke. Okay, the backup contract. So this is what we use if you, the property that got away and you wanna be first in line for it. So there's a, there's a, primary contract on the piece of property that your buyers want and they're willing to to get in line and have it this go ahead and start the contract process so that if the primary contract um, cancels for any reason then instead of the property going back on the market it would go directly to you so what you do is you go ahead and you negotiate all the terms and fill out the and then fill out the contract and you would need to find out from the listing agent the date of the other contract because that is a blank on A. And then you put if the date of the first contract, how long you're gonna wait for it to close. So some people will just wait for like the, only wanna be in backup position for, you know, days when it's an option or financing contingencies. Others are fine, you know, waiting it out until, um, until the, the closing date. So if that's what you're going to do, find out those dates. I always say just do the closing date because, you know, even though it looks pretty solid, you never know what can happen. And as long as you pay for an option period and um, during backup period, you will have an option. You'll have two options. One during the whole time you're in backup and then one during the number of days you've negotiated in the contract. So therefore, if while you're in backup, maybe you're waiting, you know, 35 days for con to see if contra primary contract's going to close, something else comes up. Well, you can you can cancel it, get your earnest money back, and move on. So, and if you do this, what it, people normally do is they will put down a small amount of option fee and a small amount of earnest money while they are in backup, and then put down the regular amount, um, you know, the normal say, you know, 300 and 1% um, respectively for option and earnest money. So, and I've got, I've got some language I can share with you um, just to kind of clarify that, but that's, that's usually acceptable to a listing agent um, to, to do the small amount first and, and then amp it up to, to, the, to the standard amounts. Okay, sell a property by buyer. This is like if you, people will refer to this as being contingent. You know, um, this is if the buyer to buy the property, um, they need to first sell their existing home. So we're not seeing too much of this in this market just because people are fighting for properties, but Whenever the market shifts and becomes a little more buyer centric, um, we will see more of this. Um, so the seller is taking a risk, basically that they are going to um, go under contract with, with this buyer, even though the buyer's not going to be able to, to perform until um, his first contract, first property sells. So what you do here is you fill out in section A, the address of the buyer's property they're trying to sell. And if you are doing this, they usually ask for just to make sure 
to, to find out details about the property. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're willing to do it, even in this market, if it's already under contract, if the first property that the buyer is selling it is under contract, um, as opposed to, you know, it's not even on the market, but we're going to put it on next week. I did have someone, you know, manage to do this really quick timing and get something done and underway in my office um, right away. Um, using this, but so, and it says, what happens then is it will go show in Netris as, um, as an um, kick, out. kick out, yes. So the kick out is, so we're gonna talk about the kick out now. So if the seller accepts a written offer to sell the property, seller shall notify buyer of such acceptance and that seller requires buyer to waive the contingency. Buyer must waive the contingency on or before blank date. Um, so let's say it's still showing as active kickout in Netris. So some people won't show that property necessarily because it has that, but because there is a chance that it, it is still available um, and the buyer could be kicked out, um, you do show it, right? And someone comes along, makes an outright offer without a contingency, what the seller does then is go back to the buyer and say, hey, buyer, we got this other offer, you know, and let's say you put three days in B. Um, can you perform? Are you, will, are you willing to perform? Can you somehow come up with the money to do it? Or if not, you know, we're moving on to this other, this other buyer who doesn't need the contingency. So if the buyer cannot, then um, they get their earnest money back, right? Um, if they can, then they need to deposit additional money and that's set forth in C to show that they are serious, you know, to show that they have some skin in the game. So I would make this, you know, at least a thousand or so to make sure um, they are willing to do it because you know you want your assurances that they are um, able to go forward. Does that make sense? All right. Um, no. Okay, Dexter, what's your question? <laughs> so this is when I'm placing the offer for my buyer, I'm saying it's contingent upon me them selling this property over here. That's right. why I'm putting in A, uh -huh. right? Right. But it sounds like you're saying B is if the sellers are. So if the seller gets another offer, another party right. comes in and gets an offer, they're coming back to your clients, you know, who have this addendum for sale of other property attached to their offer and saying, you know, we've got this other offer, you know, are you, we're going to go with them unless you show us that you can waive this contingency. So, um, you know, maybe they could all along have, you know, afforded two mortgages, but just didn't want to do that. Or maybe somehow they can scrape together the cash, maybe a family member's loaning it to them. So, um, and the, so they're giving them the opportunity to waive this contingency and move forward and not go forward with um, the second party who has submitted the offer on the house. Okay, and a lot so of times we're, not, here we're not under contract yet. You're under contract with this addendum attached to it. They're not under contract with the second buyer who's come along. So a lot of times what happens is if, if like Angela has a listing and I have a buyer that really wants it, but we have to sell our house, I'll call Angela and say, would you take a contingency? And she'd be like, tell me about your buyer's house. And I would be like, my buyer's house is a darling little jewel box. And we just haven't put it on the market yet because they were X, Y, and whatever reason, but I've got the photos. I've got it ready. It's going on the market tomorrow. I expect that we'll get it under contract over the weekend. Then Angela may be like, okay, I know Zareen. She knows what she's doing. They clearly have their ducks in a row. They have a plan. That house is priced right. I know that area. I feel good about this. If it's some, if you get an offer with this attached from some rando and you don't know anything about what the situation is with the house that they're selling, I would do some digging. So that's usually how it works, right, Angela? Is that like, yeah. if when you're, you're trying to convince the sellers to take this, so you have to explain like, here's our plan for getting this property sold and we're confident we can do it. Yeah, I get that. But 
Are you saying we're under contract with a contingency, but the seller, while you're under contract, they can submit this addendum and because they received another offer and and terminate the contract? Yeah. So so okay, so let's say that happens. Is that Angel is like, let's take Zareen's offer. It's contingent, but I think that it's gonna work out perfect. So I'm working to get my listing under contract. And in the meantime, Dexter, you see that Angela's listing is listed as active kickout in the MLS. And you say to your buyers, let's go look. Um, and you buy your buyers love it. And you make an offer and Angela's sellers are like, this is a good offer. And Dexter's people don't have any contingency. So you would execute a backup contract between Dexter's buyers and Angela's buyers. And Angela would then turn around to me and say, Zareen, we have a backup contract. You have, and then it's like, whatever she, I'm giving you notice. You have this many days to either waive the contingency or terminate and get the contract back. And if, and if I had my house under contract already, and it was looking like we were going to get through option and everything was really good. My buyers may say, we'll just waive the contingency. Like we're not worried about it. We know our house is going to sell. So we want to keep, we want to proceed and waive our contingency. Or my buyers may say, no way. We're not taking that risk. We're not even through our option period. So we would terminate and Dexter, your people would become the new contract. Does that make sense? That's how that goes. You, the, okay. the, you have to so the, put the, the second buyer has to put the property under contract with a backup addendum. And then the listing, the seller turns around to the first buyer and says, we have a new backup contract. So you guys either need to waive the contingency or, or terminate and get out of the way. Basically, the seller is forcing the original purchaser to either sign that they're going to perform the offer and move forward without any additional conditions or you know cancel or basically wave and walk away from the house right right doing. right yeah i get it i i just i yeah that's weird to me <laughs> so my 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 buyer has no security even if they're under contract, period. Well, they do, they, do. But, but they, have to waive the, yeah. they have to waive the contingency. They can't just be kicked out. Like if they just have to be willing to waive their contingency. Cause I mean, that's only fair to the seller, right? Do you want a sure thing with no contingency or do you want this one that the buyer has the right to terminate because they never sell their house? So everyone gets something. The buyer can't be kicked out. They just have to be willing to, to remove the contingency. In a more regular market, you'll see situations where the buyer's house doesn't sell for four to six months if there's potentially something wrong or it's in a bad neighborhood and the people who are trying to sell the home, you know, don't want to wait that long. It, it's a real rough situation to get. In the yeah. Middle. Yeah. And that's when you start seeing more of these. I get it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, inspector information. This is this is a form that it is good to give your buyers, um, telling them about what an inspection is, and um, it is really good to use when people are waiving the inspection, which we are seeing sometimes. So, um, on this one, we have it filled out. We were recommending, you know, giving names of several inspectors, and always let them know. Of course, you know choose your own, find your own inspector, but here's a couple I've used before and I like. And then the last section is they are choosing if they want to or don't want to hire an inspector. Um, so I think, you know, again, this is good to use, but I absolutely would use it if they are choosing to waive the inspection. So yes, does that makes sense. Yeah. This is just a good CYA too of like, that says, these are some names we're not recommending anyone because a lot of times buyers will be like oh just pick someone schedule it we don't care but then if they miss something then it's your fault so this is a nice cya yes okay guys it is 10 37 yeah. so we should probably end here i think we've covered lots and lots today mm -hmm. and i appreciate you guys you know sticking around for the extra 37 minutes. So hopefully you've gotten some value out of these classes. And again, feel free to reach out whenever you, you have questions about 
about what we talked about today or anything else. So, so just please in advance, please don't be offended that I haven't learned anything in class, but when I get a real deal, Angela, like you are going, you know, you and I are sitting side by side. That's okay. fine. You know, That's... I, look, but look, I've got Laura, but there, there's a dozen places you can screw up. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll be fine. Yes. You gotta learn by doing, but yeah. it's good for you guys to show up here just so that you have an inkling in your head of like what we said that one time, right? Yeah. So, thank you for showing up, guys. Bye, thank guys. You. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you.